Amara um, will be speaking tonight. Uh, so Future Focus is a speaker series featuring Maine's youth climate justice activists, young adults that Maine are innovating, organizing, and leading efforts to connect and address the most pressing social and environmental issues we face, and many have garnered statewide, national, and international recognition and accolades. So this is a youth-led monthly webinar series highlighting youth climate justice activists and their stories from across the state. Each one hour session is focusing on a different individual and the intersectional leadership work they are doing in their community and beyond. So tonight, Samara Fiji, and on January 5th at 4.30 p.m. we'll be with Sarohi Kumar facing a climate emergency. Uh, we ask that you keep your camera off and you stay muted while Amara is presenting. Um, at the end, we will have a Q&A session. You can turn your camera on for this session, but please stay muted. And while Amara is talking, at any point, you can put a question in the chat. We'll be answering these questions at the end. If this will be recorded and is being recorded, so if you're uncomfortable being in the recording, no pressure to turn your camera on at the end. Um, so again, thanks for being here. Drop any questions you have in the chat that we'll answer at the end. And I'll hand it over to our presenter tonight, Amara Fiji. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Anna. And thank you all um, for joining us tonight. Um, as a bit of an introduction, my name is Amara. Um, first and foremost, I'm a college student. I go to Northeastern. Um, and I'm also the grassroots development coordinator for the Maine Environmental Education Association. Um, and I'm just going to be speaking to um, my stories and my lived experiences um, in this work um, in the environmental sector and how that really prompted me to, um, I guess, go out and be the change that I want to see in the world in terms of this, of this sector. So um, I guess we can start with um, kiddo Amara, um, I really, really liked playing outside. Um, and I think that that pretty much holds for all environmental stewards or climate justice activists, um, that call or um, connection to place with the environment. And so um, that was pretty different because um, growing up, I didn't really have much of any space to play outside where I lived, but I still found ways to um, connect with the environment. Um, and in school, um, you know, the environment still remained something that I was so interested in. Um, and I really wanted to learn more about it beyond um, exploring in the dirt, but actually in a classroom setting. But despite that, um, I didn't receive much of any formal environmental education. Um, I think that I would say that the only kind of environmental or outdoor learning that I had was recess, but I don't really count that, of course. Um, and so I, I just, I would say that there's such a big difference of um, learning in a classroom setting about the outdoors and actually engaging with the outdoors. Of course, I was taught about um, things like our ecosystems and um, you know, the beautiful main woods and our beautiful landscapes, but to me, there was a huge difference between learning about those and looking at pictures and actually going outside and engaging with the beautiful landscape that our state has to offer. And so because I was not um, really getting much of this education that I was seeking in a classroom setting, um, that's when I really started to um, self-seek these learning opportunities. Um, and so in that, I, um, in high school, was the president of my school stormwater management and research team. And as part of that group, um, I worked, um, I would say, almost weekly from um, about April to um, just when the snow started to fall. Um, and I went out each week and um, sampled the Penobscot in order to ensure that um, that river was safe for recreation recreational use. Um, and I just remembered so, so, so loving going out into the field and exploring and um, just uncovering the story of the Penobscot watershed. I also in high school was um, a 
I was part of the STEM program at my school. And so I was able to further engage with um, my passion through having an independent research project that was um, focused around um, the Flint, Michigan water crisis and um, trying to resolve uh, heavy metal uh, contamination in, in drinking water. And um, I so, so loved engaging with the environment and learning more about the outdoors and uncovering that. Um, I always say this to people um, that I started off, you know, exploring in the dirt and up until I was 18 years old, I was still playing in the dirt through um, my research project and things of that sort. And yes, the environment was was one of my passions, but another one of my passions um, was advocating for social issues, particularly those of um, racial justice, as I am a BIPOC individual living in the state of Maine. And so in doing so um, at my school, I formed the Multicultural Student Union, which was a group of BIPOC students who um, convened once a week to talk about um, their lived experiences and the things that they faced at our school. Um, I also um, led some uh, racial discrimination advocacy efforts at my school, which led to uh, some great policy change in my school department. And I had my environmental action and I had my racial justice work, but I kind of put them in two different boxes. I never saw, you know, an intersection within my two passions. And that was until I attended the Maine Environmental Education Association Change Makers Gathering my sophomore year of high school when I was 16. And I really do think that that was the experience that just prompted me to um, begin engaging in this work to become a change maker and to push for this change that I was seeking in the world. Um, there I learned about the intersection of social issues and environmental issues through hearing from um, speakers like uh, Vic Barrett, who is on the um, Juliana versus the government um, case where in which youth are suing the government for um, knowingly uh, putting them in harm in terms of the environment. And I just became so impassioned, um, further impassioned about these issues that um, I have been working on, knowing that there is a link, that there's an intersection within them. And in further exploring that link, that intersection, I began reflecting on, of course, my lived experiences. Um, and I recognize things in my past and things of things like um, in terms of socioeconomic status, um, that was a barrier to access that I had in terms of fostering a connection to place with the environment. Um, I grew up um, with a mother who um, was in school. Uh, so, and my, my father also was in school and um, education was really something that was always pushed for me. But in doing so, um, that was a sacrifice because it's hard to have, of course, a full-time job and go to school as well. So in that being a barrier, I remember that um, snow pants and things and, you know, snow boots were things that couldn't really be afforded. And thus, I wasn't really able to connect with the environment, um, especially during the winter months and things like that. I remember that um, outings, um, environmental outings, were few and far between because, of course, um, being where I am, uh, it's one has to travel. And of course, there are travel expenses associated with going out and things like that. Um, so just connecting back to um, these social issues being very much so um, part of what is, is known as um, environmental equity um, and my, you know, socioeconomic status being, rep being representative of that. And then um, also just analyzing my lived experiences as well. Um, race was another factor that played into um, a barrier to access to the outdoors, as well as not being able to foster that connection to uh, the environment. Um, my mother was very, very apprehensive in me going outside, especially at nighttime, um, 
because I, I am a Black individual and there um, is of course um, in, in the Black community stigma around being outside when it is nighttime. And there is, you know, this, this narrative that when one is engaging with the outdoors, that is not a, that's not typically what Black individuals or BIPOC individuals do. So because of that stigma, because Black people don't go skiing or Black people don't go camping, I, as a Black individual, did not go skiing, I did not go camping, and I did not have a way to connect with the outdoors in that sense because of that stigma. And it really just made me think, is it the stigma itself that was the barrier or was it the fear? I think that there has been you know, a perpetuated fear um, by individuals who haven't been able to connect with the outdoors because it is the unknown, it's the uncertain. And so in that it is thing that it's a thing that causes fear in one. And I know that I had fear as well. I, you know, was scared to do all of these things to go out and engage with the outdoors because I didn't know how to, I didn't really have that connection to space or with the outdoors or anything like that. And um, I recognized that my, it was really my lived experiences that prompted me to be engaged in this work as it is. Um, if I had not recognized that there was a link between environmental and social justice issues, um, I don't really think that I would be in this work. And I think that really speaks to what is um, effective and in, in advocating for the environment. Um, I, I always say that there are very few people who just look at graphs of um, you know, CO2 trends over time and say, yes, I get it. You know, this is my passion and this is what I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing. I've only met one person who has done that. But most people, you know, after hearing stories and, um, you know, having a connection to place with the environment, that's when they wanna get prompt, that's when they are, are prompted to actually engage with the outdoors to spark change and to protect it. And so that was really the case for me as well. Um, and I recognize, of course, that these experiences that I have, these barriers, they were not unique to just me. They were, um, they are, and they're faced by millions of people uh, all over the world. And I really made an effort, or rather am making an effort, to make sure that individuals do not have those barriers because it's so, so important that one has a connection to place with the environment and the outdoors because one is not going to let the thing that they love become ruined. One is not going to let that thing be destroyed. And in the case of the outdoors with the um, environmental exploitation and um, natural disasters that we have going on, one is going to be more prompted to take action around issues such as environmental exploitation and climate change if they have a connection to place with the outdoors. So through my work um, as grassroots development coordinator with the Maine Environmental Education Association, um, I've led a couple of efforts to um, allow individuals, especially those from marginalized backgrounds, to recognize that the environment and the outdoors is, is not just a place for an individual who looks this way or who has these resources, but it is a human right. So um, Ma MIA, my organization, collaborates with the Nature-Based Education Consortium. And through the Nature-Based Education Consortium, I am the co-chair of the Communications Task Force. And we are currently working on um, a storytelling initiative for um, individuals, BIPOC individuals in particular, to share their stories in the outdoors. And these are not just you know, the success stories of um, a field trip or an excursion that prompted an individual to see that this is a place that I belong in, but also the stories that are, you know, not so nice, the stories that really allow people to see that 
this is not something that everyone feels comfortable in because I think that in allowing people to see that, that's really what's going to prompt change. So um, we're currently working on, you know, gathering those stories and hearing from BIPOC individuals. Um, similarly, as part of the um, Nature-Based Education Consortium Climate Education Task Force, um, the task force recently um, proposed a set of recommendations to the Maine Climate Council um, around climate change education, and not just climate change education in the sense of um, looking at climate change through a scientific lens solely, but also looking at climate change through a social justice lens that will prompt students to take action around the issues that they see and they learn about. Similarly, um, through uh, a collaborative project with Campaign Earth um, called Just Me for Just Us, um, this past election cycle, um, we ran a campaign around voting climate consciously and uh, really uh, making sure that youth um, and other uh, marginalized communities know that they have so much power when it comes to addressing the climate crisis, especially in voting and making sure that the individuals who are in office are also individuals who are advocating for environmental protection. Um, and lastly, through um, Mia, we recently just um, finished or wrapped up our mini grant that was launched. Um, I think it was uh, during Teacher Appreciation Day. Um, and looking at the, the stats of that mini grant, it looks as though we will have, we will give funding to a, a total seventh of all the public schools in the state of Maine, which is just so, so amazing and um, makes my so heart so happy knowing that um, this funding can be used for students to, of course, um, get that connection to the environment that will prompt them to spark the change that they want to see. Um, and so once again, all of these efforts are, of course, to help youth recognize that they have a place in the environment, to help BIPOC individuals recognize, those uh, who come from socioeconomically underserved backgrounds to recognize this. There is not a single narrative, there's not a single person, there's not a single story of an individual who belongs in the environment and who belongs in the outdoors because everyone belongs in the outdoors, everyone has a place in the environment. And that connection to the environment is really what is going to help resolve the environmental issues that um, we currently face. Because as I said, um, one is one who is passionate about something will not let that thing die or be destroyed or anything. Um, because if, they, if one truly cares about something, they will make sure um, with that passion that the issue around it is resolved. Um, and that just about concludes um, my, my presentation. And I'm gonna pass it over to Anna so that we can start the Q&A. Thanks, Mara. It was awesome to hear from you. Um, so does anyone, so just a quick reminder that uh, to please put questions in the chat. You can now turn on your camera at this time um, to create more of a community space as we do a Q&A. We are recording, uh, so if you do not want your face to be in the recording, feel no pressure to turn on your camera. Um, I'm gonna start with a question I have. If, um, before, as we wait for people to uh, think of some things to put in the chat. But I was wondering, what is your vision for the youth movement in the next five years? And this, you know, definitely intersectional um, environmental work and other kinds of justice work. Yeah, thanks so much for that question, Anna. Um, my vision for the youth movement um, in the next five years, honestly, in the next 50 years, is that um, it really remains the same. I think that the youth climate movement, the environmental movement, um, is so, so, so amazing. Um, I know that only a few years ago, there was very few and far between youth 
who were advocating for um, environmental protection and for climate justice solutions. And now um, across the globe, there are millions of youth um, working towards this. And I think that in recognizing that it's a youth movement, um, I think it's also important to highlight that um, within the youth movement, intergenerational collaboration, I think is something that is so important as well, because I cannot even name the things that I have learned from adults in this work. Um, and it, you know, it makes my heart so happy to say that those adults have learned from me as well. So I think that um, intergenerational collaboration is also so important and something that I hope remains in the um, youth climate um, and environmental movements. And lastly, um, I hope that what I'm seeing now is that um, the issues of um, pertaining to the environment, they are huge. They are on a global scale. And that's really daunting if a 16 year old is looking at those issues and wants to spark change. And I think it's it's much easier to spark change in one's community and you know as a local effort um, than it is to per se to speak at um, some UN um, global climate conference. So I would say that within the youth movement, I hope that a lot of local advocacy continues because I think that that is just um, a wonderful way for one to. Um, connect to global efforts in sparking change in this movement. Yeah, definitely adult allies, I think are key to a lot of work. Um, definitely helped me as well. I started with adult allies. I started with teachers. Uh, uh, similar to that, Melissa asked, what are some examples of things that adults can do to help Maine youth connect directly to the outdoors? What would have helped you? Yeah. Um... I think that what would have helped me was just more learning opportunities. Um, like I said, a lot of the learning opportunities that um, I engaged with when learning about the outdoors, when connecting with the outdoors were self-sought. I would have hoped that instead of learning about, um, you know, the ecosystems of Maine um, in, in a classroom and just looking at the pictures on like the Promethean board that we had to actually have um, gone out to um, the Bangor Forest, which was right next to my school, and be able to explore those those ecosystems and things of that of that sort um, in a way that you know I could connect with it in real time. Because, um, like I said, it's it's just re it's really different. Of course, I can look at a picture for days uh, around the environment and admire it in that way, but there is just a different feeling, a different connection when one actually gets to um, touch and feel and, and scope out the environment with um, their own eyes and their other senses. Um, so as I think that in terms of education, um, that more opportunities to engage with the outdoors would have helped me and I hope those um, will be implemented. Um, another thing is um, around that, I didn't receive much of any climate education, which is something that I would have hoped to um, have had. Um, and so that's why in, in this work that I do, um, advocating for climate justice education is something that is really at the forefront of, um, I guess, my priorities as an activist. Awesome. Um, Mackie asks, I'm a third grade teacher in Lewiston, working with many BIPOC students from low income backgrounds. What do you think is the biggest priority for me to help support my students in this area besides plenty of opportunities for outside learning on our nature trail. So I guess taking what you said further, what is the biggest priority beyond just learning outside? I think that the major issue in this work is of course funding. Um, as a student, I would have hoped to um, have um, you know, like coats and and gloves and snow pants and, and boots and all of those things, especially in winter, um, as well as other outdoor gear. But of course, funding is always um, a problem. It's always an issue. Um, but I know that there are a bunch of different sites where one can, you know, request funding and things of that sort to help the students who might come from socioeconomically underserved backgrounds like I did. 
Um, so I would say that is, is one thing, but I also think that it's very important to incorporate story and storytelling in, in one's work um, and in fostering um, a connection with the environment and the outdoors, um, especially success stories, of course. If I heard a story about how um, another BIPOC individual like myself had an amazing time and connection with the outdoors, I think that would have really prompted me to get over the uncertainty, to get over the unknown and just go out and engage. So I think those stories are really important. Finding those stories and telling those stories, highlighting those stories um, would be something that, you know, looking back would have served me so greatly. And I think that will serve, you know, your students very greatly in hearing those. Fantastic. Where do you see your work going in the future? I know that can be a complicated question because often activism is very of the moment of the issue that's happening. But I guess if you almost had a passion project or something like that. Yeah. Um, in five years, I'm not sure. Um, to be frank, um, I do so. I do see myself still engaged in this work um, and continuing it. Um, I think if one finds their passion, um, the thing that they know they can spend the rest of their life doing, even if it, at, it is at my only 18 years of age, that one should continue that um, and continue to um, do the thing that they love. So I do, of course, still see myself um, in this work. Um, I have guess been working at like a statewide level um, through MIA, but I hope to um, work, I guess, at a national level. Um, still, of course, um, grassroots organizing, but um, I guess can further connecting communities to one another um, to really help mobilize the um, climate justice efforts uh, in this country. So uh, Jessica asks, um, how can the traditional environmental and conservation movement get better at addressing these intersectional issues along with anti-racism? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that I'll preface with saying that in order to get comfortable, in order to be in a place where not just one person feels comfortable, but everyone in that work feels comfortable. One needs to get uncomfortable. I am a huge advocate for um, some pretty game-shaking systems change. Um, and so because of that, I think that one really needs to look internally in their work and in the things that they do. What are one's practices? Do they have equity within those practices? Are they, formed, you know, thinking of not just one individual or one community, but all individuals and all communities. And I think that in analyzing that, if one can say, yes, you know, I have equity in my, in all of the practices that I do, I'm really, all the thing, the work that I do really benefits all communities, then that is really when one can say that, you know, they are, addressing this, these issues in an intersectional way. But if one cannot say yes to those questions, I think that what is really called for is some, some work at the internal level um, to make sure that first and foremost, um, the practices that the organization or, um, yeah, the organization or the nonprofit is, is implementing that those are really what is rooted in uh, addressing these issues of equity. Um, and through um, my work at MIA, we actually have these organizational equity calls once a month where we um, we help folks to recognize their, their organizational practices and things of that sort, and how to really root these practices in equity in order to ensure that they are intersectional and they do address these issues um, of, you know, racism and um, other other issues pertaining to social justice. Fantastic. Um, so Rick asks, are you aware of any cities, states, or school systems 
in which environmental or climate education has been incorporated into a standard curriculum. So beyond just like a special class or a college course only for the environmental uh, policy majors, et cetera. Yeah, I know that there is, there's quite a few, but the first one that comes to mind is um, the state of, there's two that come to mind actually. Um, the state of Washington um, has their um, climb time, um, climate education efforts. And um, I must say that I don't know enough to be dangerous about it, um, but I know that it has really inspired a lot of um, change and that um, it is being implemented in public schools to ensure that students are receiving climate change education. And then similarly, I know the state of New Jersey and their um, first lady um, is, is she really led the efforts to have um, a mandatory climate um, change and climate justice oriented education components into the curriculum for all K through 12 students. Um, and I think these policies are so, so amazing. And um, I would hope that, you know, all states adopt these policies so that students can learn about um, climate change. Um, and in to go further to that, I would say that I hope that students, you know, don't just learn about climate change, but learn about climate justice and how the issues of climate change are related to these social justice issues. I second that, that is incredibly important. Um, so this is a last call for questions. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah, so do you have any uh, comments or thoughts about the education recommendations in the Climate Action Plan released by the Maine Climate Council? Uh, the Maine Climate Council released the Climate Action Plan today, um, actually. So if you, of course, like not expected to be an expert on it already, um, but if you have, if you have looked over or have any thoughts about that. Yeah, um, I must say that I have not looked at those yet. Um, I know that there's some kind of event um, being held by Maine Conservation Voters tomorrow, like a debrief for those who, um, like myself, are who don't really, you know, like read those things, but prefer um, like a presentation. Um, but I think that maybe Anya, if I can tag you um, around, you know, those those recommendations. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so um, Amara and I both worked with the Nature Based Education Consortium, which Amara mentioned in her talk. Uh, to come up with some recommendations for the Maine Climate Council on education. Um, and they kind of half made it into the plan. And so um, looking forward to continuing to work with Amara and uh, the Nature-Based Education Task Force to, um, to make sure that, you know, things that, things like what's happening in New Jersey that Amara was just talking about um, start to come to, to Maine. So hope, hopefully that's a good answer, Mara. Feel free to embellish. <laughs> Thanks, Anya. Yeah, um, I think I also um, feel that as well. Hopefully, you know, the great work that's happening across the country um, in terms of climate education efforts comes to Maine as well. Great, Amara, do you have any last thoughts or words that you'd like to share with the group? Um, I would just say, first and foremost, thank you all so much um, for joining us this evening. Um, and I would also say that um, if you are an educator and work with, with youth, even if it's not in a traditional environmental um, space, um, that it's really important to, um, you know, encourage youth to play outside, um, to say, you know, it's really cool to be a tree hugger. Um, I think the statistic is that uh, youth get about only eight minutes of um, outdoor time each day. Eight minutes is not enough. Eight minutes is really not enough, especially when you're trying to build a relationship with the outdoors. So I would say to adults who work with youth, especially that um, it's really important that one advocates and um, shares with their youth that engaging with the outdoors is something that is truly so, so important in this work. 
Great. Well, I guess I echo Amara's sentiment that thank you all for coming. Um, the next future focus talk is January 5th, 4.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. with Sarohi Kumar facing a climate emergency. You can register right here. Um, the link is in the chat. And thank you all so much and have a great evening.